It was Bigfoot that gave birth to the monster truck craze. Today, Mike and Pat continue the rebuild of its original blown 640, from battle scars to the machine shop. We're back in the shop and ready to dig a little deeper into the original Bigfoot's power plant. That's because we get to refresh it and give it back to Bob Chandler so he can take the original monster truck Bigfoot One on its final tour before plans on heading to the Smithsonian. This time it's not disassembly but more of a CSI approach which we'll call ESI or engine scene investigation. We have the original build sheets and our goal is to see how much abuse this engine has gone through and how much it's changed since day one. Take a look at what we found so far. Last week, we had the honor to start the teardown of the complete Allen Root 640 cubic inch big block Ford that started the monster truck craze back in the 1980s. Now this engine sat for over 20 years, so we started by removing each component and inspecting them to see what we had our hands on. We all learned together that technology has changed and some of the items are no longer available. Now we ended with a bare Allen Root aluminum block. After a one hour wash cycle, the aluminum block is dried off with compressed air and ready to go on the stand to continue our forensic investigation. Giving it a good cleaning helps reveal details that weren't obvious in our original teardown and we found a few things worth noting, like the first being a major repair in the lifter valley. A catastrophic engine failure caused this section of the block to be blown out requiring major reconstruction. Compared to the architecture next to it, the difference is very obvious. A solid chunk of aluminum had to be welded in and machined to reconstruct the lifter bores and the oil galley that feeds them. That same failure caused an exit wound to the exterior that was also repaired by being welded up. The repairman even left his calling card with an impression of his initials and the date on the block. The damage was also on the inside. We're guessing the carnage was caused by a broken connecting rod because that's a typical damage path of that type of failure. Damage like that would undoubtedly destroy the sleeve as well, so it was replaced too. We also noticed a small repair to the deck surface. This discoloration you're seeing is actually epoxy that was used as a filler. Even more visual than that is this heavy gouging on the china rail. It's most likely caused by prying the intake manifold off during its years of service. During one of those prying sessions, a fastener must have been left in the rear of the intake and this scar was the result. This kind of stuff happens when you're thrashing to get to the next round. Keep in mind guys, battle scars like these are the result of years of competition with the same engine. These Allen Root race blocks were made to withstand big power and lots of punishment. And out back, we already showed you the first discovery during disassembly. Too long of flywheel bolts were installed at some point and they self-clearanced on the back of this cap and block. The fix after these bolts were removed required helicoils to the crank. There are several stampings on the block as well. These are the torque specs for the main caps. And also the original birth date when it was cast the foundry, E2ZM. The E stands for the 80s and the 2 is for the year, so 1982. The Z designates Ford aftermarket parts, so don't expect to find this in any production vehicle. And the M indicates performance. Even though this block was designed for racing use, it shares some common dimensions with the 385 series big block Ford, which was the 429 and 460, like the oil pan rail. The only difference in this one is it was scalloped for extra rod clearance, allowing this stock 429 460 gasket to still be used. The stock main journal housing size of 3.1922 is also used, and the same goes for the factory rear main seal. It also has the provision to run a stock oil pump, but an external line would have to be ran from here to the rear of the block, which is the oil inlet. Now that's because this block was set up to be either a wet or dry sump application. The cam tunnel is also in the factory location and retains the stock diameter. Now up here, even though we removed a magneto, the factory distributor hole is present, so one could be used. Also up front, if a couple of holes were drilled in the timing cover, a factory style water pump could be used. With all that said, this block is pretty versatile and can easily be made to run on the street. Now next, we're breaking out the measuring tools and getting technical. With the use of some micrometers and a dial bore gauge, the ESI investigation is digging deeper. Next, size does matter, all the way to the thousandths of an inch.
Continuing on, we're turning the page to the technical chapter. Now tools like this micrometer and this dial bore gauge are what we need to measure the diameter of the engine's components. Now what we're looking for is to see how much this engine has changed from the original build sheet. So let's get started. Making a build sheet takes time, but it's standard procedure for any serious engine builder. It's a blueprint of the entire engine, which is basically documentation. It's a sheet that we reference time and time again over the engine's service life. The original builder of this engine, Norm Grimes, did an excellent job on this one. The entire engine was well thought out and we have evidence of it. He noted all the tolerances as well as the parts that were used. He even noted the original job numbers from the manufacturers of the pistons and rods. The first thing I'm going to do is measure the bore size. It's at the top of the list so it's a good starting point. Originally it was 4625. Let's see what changed. We'll have to set the dial bore gauge up to the original bore size. Using a 4 to 5 mic, we'll air set the size to 4625. Air setting means you're setting the size of the micrometer without the use of a standard. Instead of relying on the tension of a part between the two points of a mic, you have to keep tension on it to get an accurate reading. It takes the backlash out of the threads inside the mic to mimic a part being in place. Now we can set the size in the dial bore gauge, zero it out, and we're ready to measure. I'm placing the gauge in the cylinder about halfway down the bore. Then slowly rock it back and forth until the needle on the gauge stops at its breakover point, which is the widest point. And the reading is 4.6303. That's almost five and a half thousandths more than it started out, which means it was honed several times during its lifespan. We'll check every cylinder to find the largest one because that will help us determine what oversize we'll take it to on our freshen up. Ooh. And here is exactly why we do that. On the opposite bank we found a cylinder that was over nine thousandths bigger than the stock bore. It's not exactly surprising to find it in an old war horse like this because sometimes you got to do what it takes to keep things running. And in this case, turn those 66 inch tires. Now the pistons are measured to see how much skirt clearance it has right now. That's the clearance between the piston skirt and the cylinder wall. According to the build sheet, the piston should measure 4, 6, 10. They are coming out 46095 because of a slight amount of wear. This is what the clearance was when the engine was first built by Norm based off the build sheet. They have 15 thousandths clearance. On the right side of the board is what the largest bore measures now, as well as what the piston currently measures. We'll subtract the piston size from the bore size and that gives us a clearance of 25 thousandths which is the worst case scenario and that is excessive. Resting on our Goodson measuring and inspection stand is the backbone of the Bigfoot 1 engine and there's no mistake in it. Now it's got a 4750 stroke and we notice that the rod and the main journals have been ground undersized to fix previous failures. For convenience, we're going to measure all the rod journals first because we'll have to relocate the stand to measure all the mains. Now using a 2 to 3 inch micrometer, we're going to measure the area where the rod bearing rides on the journal in two locations, one at vertical and one 90 degrees from that location. Now that method is going to let us know if that journal is out or round. The vertical reading is 2.3633. 90 degrees from it measures 2.3630 which means it's out of round three ten thousandths. This is important to find because the largest part of the journal is what's needed to set minimum oil clearance. The same procedure is done on the mains and it's for the same reason. The first journal measures 2.9793 at the vertical reading and 2.9795 at 90 degrees, making it two ten thousandths out of round. Be sure to measure them all to make sure there isn't anything crazy going on. We found the journals to be all slightly out of round, but not bad enough to need regrinding. Now it's time to go to the machine shop for a good polishing. Our investigation has uncovered some interesting facts. Now we'll get it back to race engine status with the help of big block Ford guy John Kazi at Kazi Racing Engines, because this piece of history deserves the best. A huge contributor to success on the track is big, reliable horsepower under the hood. That's why we traveled to Winder, Georgia and John Kazi Racing Engines to assist in reviving Bob Chandler's Big Block Ford. We did our own version of a forensic teardown and this is what it's going to need. Replacing of the sleeves, a line honing the mains and the cam tunnel, honing the board of size by using a torque plate and o-ringing the top of the sleeves to accept new copper head gaskets. And the nice thing is, 
Everyone we've called has been more than willing to volunteer their expertise to help get this iconic engine back between the frame rails, including the man with the skills and reputation for building the best Ford engines on the planet. I really caught the bug about when I was 13. But lawnmowers, mini bikes, motorcycles, and then cars. And since 1980, John Kazi Racing Engines has supplied our need for speed with custom heads, intakes, and now turnkey engines. He's a Ford guy, just like his former boss, late pro stock legend, Dino Don Nicholson. Today, John and his team of experienced machinists lead the way in blue oval performance, on the track and on the street. Just absolute genius. Comes up with ideas in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, wakes up, starts taking notes. You come in the next day and it's a whole new project. Like bringing the Boss 429 back to life with affordable replica packages that deliver from 500 to 1,000 reliable horsepower. It's gone from a two-man shop to a uh, multi-million dollar operation. We, uh, we really enjoy what we're doing. Uh, all our guys here, we've got a really good bunch of guys. Everybody comes into work pretty happy, enjoys what they do, and, and we have a blast. It's all about bettering technology, which is why we entrusted Kazi with the Bigfoot first-gen Allen Root block. Those blocks were a little bit on the flimsy side, you know. The bores were really big for the sleeves. They tend to move around a lot, and the bores wouldn't be real, they wouldn't stay round. We took all the sleeves out and cleaned everything up. Then we had special sleeves made that we put in. But the sleeves themselves are real thick wall. And well, that means the bore is smaller, but when you're working on a supercharged engine, you know, the, the last little bit of cubic inch that you got from the bore size, I don't know if it's really that important anyway, because you almost need more blower to fill it up, you know, and I, I think that probably rounder bore and a few less inches would be way better than more cubic inches and all the air going by the rings. With the block back to ambient temp, Chris Thomas can proceed with the align hone process. This will ensure all the main bores are the same size and in perfect alignment. First, Chris will set up his dial bore gauge to 3.1930. With the mains torque to 85 foot-pounds, he'll measure to see how much has to be honed out to get to the correct size. Now the appropriate mandrel is put in, and with the tension set, he can begin. Material comes out fast with aluminum, so it doesn't take long before the job is complete. Switching to a smaller mandrel, he'll do the same operation to the cam tunnel finishing them at 2 250. That block's had more than one accident in its life. We can see some welding in the valley and stuff and on the outside and, and we don't know exactly where it's been and what it's done, so we gotta check a lot of that stuff. The machining continues along with massaging the heads. Today we're in Winder, Georgia at John Kazi Racing Engines a world-renowned high-performance engine shop specializing in big Ford power. Everybody that we've got here essentially can do all the jobs. Everybody uh, has the ability to do the machine work, do the assembly, dyno work, and really do a, a really good quality job of whatever we do. Before getting started, the Hone's guide shoes and stones have to be set up for the engine's bore size. Using a cylinder gauge and shims, it's an easy task. Now Chris will install a torque plate and tighten it down to spec before honing starts. The plate simulates the stress of a cylinder head being on the engine, which can distort the cylinders out of round. That affects ring seal and ultimately power, so honing with a torque plate attached ensures the bores stay straight and round, maximizing horsepower potential. When all said and done, the final bore size in this beast is 4,377. While the block gets a quick bath, veteran machinist Ron Baker checked the crank for cracks. Then, use the Goodson polishing machine you have to, be a little careful. to clean up the journals. Then onto the boring bar to get O-ring grooves cut for the use of copper head gaskets. 10 at zero. A 4,600 diameter groove is cut to 27 thousandths deep to accept a 39 thousandths stainless wire. This seals in the combustion of the big blown Ford. Chris, performance machining is as much as an art as it is a science. Honored to be a part of it. And, uh... We made a quick trip down the street to John Kazi's trusted cylinder head guy, Chris Howe of Howe Racing Heads. A valve job, um, the seating area is one angle. 
in a competition valve job, we'd run multiple angles, and you're, there you're trying to increase the airflow. And if we increase the airflow, you increase your horsepower. You can't have any run out. You have to have a valve job that seals. You don't want uh, leak down or, or leaking valve seats. So everything's got to be precise. Before starting, Chris had already put new liners in the intake guides and set up the proper clearance. Any competition valve job has very specific angles per the application. In multiple stages using different cutters, the angles are as such. A 35 degree top cut, a 45 degree seat angle, a 65 degree bottom cut, and a 75 degree bowl cut. This will give a good balance of power and longevity to Bigfoot's AR Hemi heads. Onto the exhaust side for the same operation. The difference being the top cut is changed to 32 degrees and the radius cut is under the 45 degree seat cut. All right. After all of the machining is finished, Chris will check the seat contact by lapping the custom manly valves to the seats using fine lapping compound. There you go, that's a beauty. That wraps up the heads. Now back to Kazi's to pick up the block and crank and hit the road. We're trying to restore it back to original running condition. And I don't think the last bit of power in this engine is going to be really needed anyway. I think it wants to run good and be dependable and not leak, not leak water into the oil, not leak combustion into the crankcase, stuff like that. So we're trying to make it a nice drive around engine for the Bigfoot people. Perfect. Guys, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. You've uh, helped us immensely. You've uh, helped with a piece of history, and uh, um, I think it's going to run great, and I was very happy to have you guys part of it. So We're glad to be part of it. It's a fun right. job. Thank you very much. Yep. Yes, Hope uh, works good. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to hear it run. <laughs> I'll, keep you, I'll keep you posted on, on the progress. All right. Well, if you get bored, bring it back. We'll run it. All right. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Increased horsepower requires increased fuel supply, and Excel's 500 thruster series in-tank pumps for EFI deliver the goods by supporting up to 900 horsepower while still using the stock fuel lines. Its turbine design is E85 compatible, and it's a direct fit in most applications, and it also comes with a handy installation kit. It's also great for EFI conversions and has a flow rate of 500 pounds per hour at 43 and a half PSI. Best of all, it's available at your local performance center for under 200 bucks. If you're building a stout LS engine with a four inch or larger bore diameter, then you've got to get your hands on a set of TrickFlow's new Gen X 255 cylinder heads. Now these things are designed using key features from GM's LS3 and LS7 head, but the engineers at TrickFlow put their own twist to design the ultimate square port head. Now back here they have a 69cc combustion chamber and the valve angle has been changed from 15 to 12 degrees to allow for more piston to valve clearance which also lets you run a larger camshaft. Now if you want to get your hands on a set, plan on spending 1300 bucks a piece over at Summit Racing. Do you want the biggest bore throttle body with the most features for your modified LS? Well this Holley 105mm unit is set up for cable drive and has a tapered bore for increased low speed drivability. Plus it's packed with other features like an idle bleed adjustment screw and an innovative TPS clocker adjustment that allows the TPS to be rotated back into the ECU's idle voltage range. Plus it's even set up for cruise control. The price of all of this high techery? About 450 bucks. Well that's it for us here at Engine Power. We'll see you next time.